Today we get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, packaging. And today we are talking about wraps. Let's get wrapping. So we're going to discuss and talk about the effect wraps have on patient safety. We're going to talk about how to identify the most common holes in wraps and explain the importance of proper wrapping technique. As we go through this presentation, you will see a star next to some of the key points. These stars are important because they will help you at the end of this presentation for your quiz so that you can get your CEs. So pay attention to the stars. So let's wrap about this. No, I, I'm really not going to do that to you. Um, but yeah. All right. So the FDA classifies packaging material in general as a class two device. So packaging material, I'm sorry, that is considered a sterile barrier. It's a class two medical device. That means it has to go through numerous testing and um, validations before it can get approval to be used as a sterile barrier. And a class two device this requires a 510K clearance and is considered a moderate risk device, um, so meaning that it could potentially cause harm to a patient. And when we talk about holes and sterile wraps, that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? Holes in a wrap, Ugh, it's the vein of our existence. Um, we all know the fun and the joy we get when we get called to the OR because a tray has a hole in a wrap, you know, we shrink down and we wanna scream. Um, you know, it happens, trays get holes and the way we talk we're going to talk about ways to help prevent that from happening and we know when we get holes and wraps there's a lot of effects that it has right it has effects on patient safety um, obviously if especially if the patient is under anesthesia um, delays in the OR causing you know backups in the cases the dynamics between the teams, we know, then we start getting the finger pointing and the, no, it's your fault and it's my fault and it's their fault. And wait, nobody says it's my fault, right? That's everybody else's fault. Um, and then we have the cost, right? Cost of repackaging, cost um, to the patient if the patient's in the operating room, and then also storage efficiency. This is something that we really don't think about, right? Like. Is our storage system efficient to help prevent holes? Also, do we start buying way too much inventory because we're so afraid of getting holes? Um, you know, and then how does that affect the cost again when we go back to that? And then also staffing. So when we talk about holes in, tra in wraps and in um, our packaging systems, they're really important. It's really important to understand that the smallest hole can do some major damage. And that's why we have to do our due diligence to protect the sterile barrier systems and packaging. And then also to check and make sure, um, you know, before we put it on the case cart that there's no holes in it. Um, each touch point that we have that we're checking to make sure that that packaging is still intact and okay to you, um, okay to go to the patient. As you can see here, the smallest size that a human can see unaided is 100 microns. So a hole that is 100 microns wide um, going across is the smallest that we can see. And so something as small as Staphylococcus aureus, which is only one micron, can cause so much havoc to a patient, right? And cause so many problems. And that's something so small, just one micron. Can you imagine how, you know, how many can get into a good size hole in a wrap if that was transferred? So let's do our due diligence to make sure that our packaging systems are good to go when they leave our departments. So I want to talk about what's in a wrap. When we talk about wraps, what are we talking about? 
So there's two main types of wraps. We have our woven wrap and we have non-woven wrap. So once again, these are both, these are FDA cleared, um, their packaging system, and they have to go through clearance before they can be considered a sterile barrier. And part of that, once again, is different testing. So we need to make sure that when we're talking about our different wraps, we understand the difference between woven and non-woven. So woven wraps are considered reusable wraps. These are the muslin wraps um, that mainly used to be used in the old days. Um, we don't really see muslin as much. Um, and these wraps, they have to be tracked, like how many uses have to be tracked on these. Um, in addition to like if they get a any damage or a hole to get repaired, there's a whole procedure that has to happen. They have to be repaired and there's specific guidelines to say like, okay, this patch can't be within this um, spacing of this other patch and all of these different um, rules. And on an average, usually the sterilization, post-sterilization shelf life is around 30 days. And this can vary depending on the wrap manufacturer, of course, and the different material the wrap is made out of. Then we have our non-woven wraps. These are the ones that we are used to seeing all the time. These are our disposable wraps, um, mainly made out of polypropylene material, which is a type of plastic um, material and we know that they come in like a single sheet or a bound sheet so this is the one that we're most common we most commonly see is like when we have two layers and they're bound together they're designed to minimize shedding so that there's not a lot of shedding that happens if they get rubbed um, so there's not a lot of things coming off of it and then if they're damaged, obviously they get discarded. And post-sterilization shelf life, depending on the IFUs and the company, can be six months, can be one year, and sometimes even shorter. So we need to make sure we're checking the IFUs for our wraps on what the post-sterilization shelf life is. So here you can see we have polypropylene material, and then we, which is our non-woven, and then we have our woven material. Um, and you can see this is kind of how the woven material gets interlocked to create this sterile barrier that still allows for um, air to be removed, sterilant to enter, and then seal and create a um, a barrier for microorganisms. And then on our polypropylene material, our non-woven material, um, our disposable wraps, these have pores on them. And we're going to talk about the importance of those pores. So let's talk about how do our wraps work. I like to refer to our wraps as a as like the pores on your face. So we we want to clean our face. We use hot water or warm water. I'm guessing warm, not too hot, right? We don't burn our face. Um, but we use warm water. We clean our face. And then at the end, we're supposed to splash with like cold water to close our pores. And this is supposed to help us look, you know, young and beautiful. Um, and the same concept happens with the pores on our wraps. As they go through the sterilization cycles, the heat, they open up, those pores are open up and then allows the air to exit, allows the um, sterilant to enter. So whether it's steam or hydrogen peroxide or EO, it allows it to enter into the packaging it spreads around and then it create once it's done coming out of the sterilizer once it's finished and it cools down to room temperature once it cools down those pores close so just like splashing with cold water on your face closes your pores letting this cool down it those pores close and it creates that sterile barrier system
and this is what prevents microorganisms from being able to enter back into your tray. And on side note, so many times we hear, well, you know, what about rigid containers and peel packs? And we're going to talk about that. They, they function in the same manner. And so rigid containers, your um, filters actually function similar to the wraps and the pores on the, fil on the wraps. And then peel pouches, similar is the paper side or the Tyvek side of the pouches. So why is this important? We need to understand how our wraps work and function so that we can then say, all right, we, we now understand how this works and functions. Now, when we're asked, hey, you know, the OR calls and says, hey, we need um, Dr. So-and-so's tray that just came out of the sterilizer. We don't go over there and start touching and feeling the tray to make sure that it's cool or can we release it. Or if I start calling and saying, hey, I had a turnover for, you know, Dr. Adam's tray. What do you know, when is it going to be available? What do we do? Our first and, you know, initial thought is go over there and start tapping the tray and see if it's hot. But the problem with that is now that we know that the pores are still open when the tray is hot and it's not cooled down, we all know, especially after COVID, um, that we have microorganisms on our hands all the time, right? You can lick them all you want, you can do whatever, but you're still going to have microorganisms on your hand. So no matter how much we wash them, right? And so we don't want to transfer those microorganisms back inside those trays and contaminate those trays. So if we go over to our trays when they're cooling and we start touching to see if they're still hot, we have a high chance of transferring those microorganisms back into our trays. And then, like I said, the filters on your rigid containers, so many times people will say, well, what about rigid containers? Why can't I touch that? Well, rigid containers emit moisture and microorganisms travel in moisture and their goal is to get to somewhere dark and warm and they will go into the filters, um, go through your filters into your trays. So we don't want to be touching those. Let them cool down. The question comes, how do we know if they're cool enough? Well, glad you asked. Here's how you know. We need a temperature gun. So nothing too crazy, nothing too expensive, but some simple temperature guns that we can point at the trays and we can understand what temperature they're at. So you want to get um, a couple temperature guns, right? Because we all know sometimes they get cooked themselves or go missing. So we want to back up. Um, and we ha what we're going to do is point the temperature gun at the tray and try and find out like what is the temperature of the trays before we touch it or release it for use. And your department should decide, you know, based on their room temperature, what is going to be your release temperature and then make a sign and post it in your department. So let's just say we say 80 and below, good to go. Um, 75 and below, good to go, whatever it may be. But this is the proper way to check for your trays, whether they can be released or put to storage. So when we're talking about wraps, something to consider. Wraps, peel packs, and rigid containers are considered outside containment devices. Um, they are sterile barriers and outside containment devices. So what goes outside can't go in. And what do we mean by that? You cannot take wrap and cut it and um, use it to protect glass syringes like you see in this picture inside a peel pack. Um, nor can I take a peel pack and use it to hold my forceps inside of a rigid container or a wrap tray. And you definitely don't want to take a rigid container and wrap it. Why you do, would you do that anyway? I don't know. But I've seen it done. So it happens. So let's talk about holes. One of the biggest ways we get holes in wraps is simply by 
taking them out of their box. Um, on the actual box, you can see this is um, Halyard's box is here, but on their box, they actually say, do not use a box cutter um, when you're opening this, right? You don't want the box cutter to cut through the to the blue wraps. There's nothing protecting between that tape layer or the box layer and the wraps below it. So make sure that you're watching what you use and you're not um, you're following the directions from the manufacturer. All right. So when we're talking about holes there are different types of holes that we need to be able to look at and try and identify and why is it important that we do identify this is because when we understand the hole what type of hole it is we're able to look at hey or try to drill down where could these holes have come from and how did they possibly happen right and maybe that will bring us to be better understand the situation and change the environment or the situation um, that these are ha this is happening in so for instance the first one you can see is a pressure cut um, it looks like a knife but it has like welded edges so they're not frayed kind of a plasticky kind of concept looking um, usually it's called it's caused by stacking trays or hanging off of shelves one of the big things that we see is trays being put on shelves that are too narrow and so the pressure from the tray just sitting on the edge of that shelf the whole time or sometimes they're stacked um, can really damage the packaging system in itself um, snag cuts. These are loose fibers on the edges. These resemble a triangle. Um, so it looks like it's from a pool or dragged across the surface and it got snagged and ripped. We have pressure holes which have welded edges. Um, they're very small and it's usually caused when you sandwich between trays. Most of the time these kind of happen in the corners of the trays, um, but I've seen them happen on like the top of trays, um, especially when things are being stacked um, way too much. And then puncture holes. These have frayed edges, smaller than a pressure hole, um, and these are usually caused by loose instruments, trays turned vertically. So that's a big one that we see um, often out in out in the field um, in sterile storage because of space constraints. People are trying to turn the trays over on the edge, so that really can cause damage to the wraps or the sterile barrier system. So after talking about those, what type of holes would you get in these situations? All right. So this one, we would see pressure cuts and pressure holes. Here we have the trays hanging off the edges of the cart. Again, pressure cut, pressure holes. We could get snag cuts because of the edges of that cart ripping into the wrap. And then this one, we have a burn hole or a snag. And we didn't talk about burn holes very much, um, but these can happen, especially when a wrap tray is hanging off the edge of a sterilizer cart if it's too wide and it winds up touching the edge of the sterilizer, you can get a burn hole. And then the last one here, we obviously have our puncture hole, with the instrument puncturing through. So how do we get a whole free life? So there's different devices out there that are made to help with um, reducing holes, right? Maybe it's the wrap themselves. They have uh, multiple layers and they are thicker um, or it's using a low linting towel or a liner. Um, different types of liners that are made out of specific paper or different types of material that are similar to a wrap. Um, there's multiple things out there. 
In addition, we have silicone corner protectors. So these are different, um, they're reusable. We have foam corner protectors, they're not reusable. Um, and then we have stuff like tray belts as well that go on our trays before sterilization. Each one of these has pros and cons, and depending on your facility, you should really look into what's going to work best for your facility and the situation with your um, departments. So when we're talking about wrapping, one of the biggest things that we need to discuss is the technique. How do we wrap? And what is the technique for wrapping period? So I will tell you something that's definitely not a good technique is checking and looking at your trays on top of the wraps. I see this so often, especially in smaller facilities who don't have a wrapping station, um, or maybe they do and you know somebody's assigned to vendor trays and they take the whole cart of vendor trays and they just go and put one tray on top of the wrap, they inspect it and look at it, and then they will wrap the tray in that. The problem comes is you know whether if that tray is wet you now made the wrap wet, which now we know once the wrap is wet, that should go into the garbage. Um, and then what if there's contamination that comes out of the out of one of the items and it drips onto your wraps or that, you know, that tray has to go back to decontam. So you're basically creating double work for yourself um, and to help protect the wraps and to protect the patients, we want to make sure we're inspecting our trays first. Then your liner should be um, removed from your workstation. And I mean liners like if you have something on your workstation, um, towels or liners to help you know, with your assembling process, your workstation should be wiped clean and dried, and then your wraps placed on your workstation. Once you're done inspecting all your trays and stuff, you can pile them up once you're, you've inspected them, and then you can start your wrapping process. But doing one at a time like that on top of wraps is very risky. So let's talk about some other nopes when we're talking about technique for wraps. Um, first one here, right? We've got way too much tape on this one. Right, we this when we put too much tape, we now can cause another. We can be causing another barrier for the sterilant to penetrate through. Um, you know, and tape is validated for sterilization methods, but excessive tape is a problem. So we don't need all of that tape, um, and so we don't want to use too much. I like to say, don't mummify your tray or your wrapped item. Um, creating pull tabs on non-woven disposable wraps. So this encourages people to peel that tape off of it. Um, now those are important for your, dis your reusable wraps. So if you are using reusable wraps, you do want to create pull tabs. However, non-reusable non or disposable wraps, non-woven wraps, you should not be creating pull tabs. Once they start pulling, they're going to degrade the integrity of that wrap and possibly cause a contamination situation. It's also important to choose the correct size wrap for the item you're wrapping. We talked about this a little bit earlier, right? Making sure you're choosing the thickness that you need, but also the size. If we choose something that is too large, we are creating way too many folds or too many layers um, for the item being sterilized. And then if it's too small, it could be a problem for aseptic presentation. And then the other one is dog ears. So when we're wrapping the technique we're using, we're not doing the correct technique and we're creating dog ears on our trays where water can pool. So Amy section nine talks about packaging and the different um, sterile barriers as a 
as a sterile barrier system, what needs to be considered for it to be an actual sterile barrier system. Stuff like tamper evident, um, protection of content, being able to be aseptically presented. Um, that's, a, that's a big one that we f sometimes don't pay attention to. And that is a lot to do with the way we wrap. So here again, you can see we got mummified tray. Um, this one's not as bad with the tape, but we do have a problem here, right? So what is the issues with this tray that we're seeing? So what's wrong with this picture? We got too much tape. We got overlapping tape. No tab to open it aseptically. And no initials or date written on the tape. So we don't even know who did it. So here you can see items are not completely covered. Um, the wrap is too small or we have our first flap is tucked underneath our tray. This can be a problem when trying to grab that tab to aseptically open that tray um, without contaminating it. And in one case, I've seen a tray actually flip off of the table because it was tucked so far underneath um, and it wound up flipping off. It was a Synthi small frag um, and you can imagine where all the screws went and it was the last tray. So when we're talking about proper wrapping technique, we look at our HS um, sorry, HSPA manual, where it shows us clear pictures on proper wrapping technique. And that involves actually walking out our tray to line up with the sides or edges of the item we're wrapping. So we want to make sure that we are following proper wrapping technique. I know it's a little bit different from what we were all taught. We were all taught to make it look like that envelope looking concept. Um, but that doesn't provide the most protection for our trays and the best sterility met, um, ability for it to be sterilized. So we want to follow proper wrapping technique. And note that tape can't not be used, cannot be used to hold your flaps down while you're wrapping. So no tape on the inside. So at the end, this is basically what your wrap tray should look like. Um, edges walked out, minimal amount of tape, labeled, ready to go. Placement of your indicators is important. So knowing the difference between wrapped tray and containerized tray according to the IFUs. So your wrap tray is one in the middle containerized is opposite corners um, and then if you have layers you switch corners on each layer um, wrap tray it's one in the middle for each layer if you have anything such as a um, containment device like a screw caddy or bags you're supposed to have a chemical indicator inside of those and sometimes we know those caddies are too tight like especially neuro screws um, you can't fit one in there so just pick it up and put it underneath when possible somewhere within that vicinity of that caddy bags are considered a containment device so if you're putting your count sheet in a bag inside your tray, your chemical indicator should go in the deepest part of that bag, um, no matter what you're putting inside it. So there's more. Here's some other considerations. So wrap should never be utilized as liners for your work workstations, shelves, or storage. So wraps are made to be a sterile barrier. We do not want to um, risk and listen, we know that the possibility of this happening is very little, but it could happen. So we want to mitigate risk, right? This is our job to mitigate the risk. And we want to make sure nobody comes and takes that wrap because they need that size and use it to wrap a tray. Um, so keep things that are made for sterility as such. The buy one get one free concept of sticking things inside the folds of wraps, um, count sheets inside the folds, 
that that is considered the inner part of the wrap so you're now shoving something on the inner part of the wrap you don't know the damage you're doing whether you're putting holes in it so you don't want to um, do this practice as well and then we talk about storage and transportation. Amy gives guidance about storage and transportation. ARN does as well, and so does AST. And they all pretty much mirror themselves with just different wording. The concepts are the same, but the wording's a little bit different. So you want to make sure you're basically the overall concept is protect the package. Don't just throw it on the shelves you want to make sure you're protecting it. So here you can see we have some situations where they are not being protected or they weren't protected. We got hole in a wrap here. Um, these are in sterile storage and then we've got um, trays being placed in like with non-sterile items in compromising situations. You got instruments poking in the top of it. Um, rigid containers stacked on top of wrap trays sometimes I see bins and then also your shelving system like here you have this like plastic covering that was made to put labeling and stuff on it but it's all cracked and damaged and you can imagine if somebody goes to slide that tray off of there it's going to snag and create a rip in it so then we have SPD hoarders. This is hoarders, the SPD version. Yep, there's a bunch of hoarders. So we got the OR who love to say, nope, we're going to keep it until, you know, we know that we don't need it. And then we start getting situations like this, or we only have one of it, so we're going to keep it. We start getting situations um, that occur where we've got so much piled up on a cart or we've got things piled on top of wrap trays or peel pouches and which can cause potential damage. And then we have some other storage situations, right? Like here you can see the trays are tilted on their sides on the cart, um, you know, to help carry more to a certain space. Um, oh, here's a good one is like storing your wraps, period. How are you keeping them protected? Here you can see this facility had um, glass throughout and so they had their wraps just sitting in the sunshine all day um, which wound up breaking down that wrap um, and destroying it and then also we have a picture of multiple multiple trays being stacked one on top of each other um, which can cause issues with the wraps and over here with our lovely check mark, we've got a nice system where each tray is on its own shelf. It's protected. Um, and this is basically a low touching concept where the whole rack, the tray is sterilized on that rack. Um, and then the operating room, as you can see in this picture, the nurse is coming to grab this tray and she's taking the whole rack. So she's not no longer touching the actual wrap tray until she has to, has to actually open it. Obviously, these are the news. What not to do. And then in the end, just remember, wraps can be recycled. Um, so if your facility has a recycling process for wraps, please pay attention to that and make sure you're adhering to that and not throwing them in the garbage. Um, they can be made into very different concepts and di different things. Um, at, during COVID, some people were making them into masks. Um, and you can see people have made them into different outfits and clothes. Um, some have made it into sleeping bags to help the homeless, which is amazing that people sew them together. Um, and then at the top picture there, our team actually entered into a competition for with Halyard. They do a competition, I think, like every year on um, what to use, like 
recycle the wraps and what you can do with them and we made this little pouch uh, for the technicians to hold all their stuff and we wound up winning second place for this so be creative um, think outside the box on what you can use your blue wraps for don't just be quick to throw them away and that's a wrap <laughs> pun intended yeah <laughs> all right I want to thank you all so much for joining me in this lovely session of wrapping things around and up and down um, and I want to say happy sterile processing week you guys are amazing and you truly are the heart of the hospital and we could not do anything without you so kudos to you guys happy sterile processing week truly from the bottom of my heart my wrapped little heart. Um, I wish you guys a fun, exciting, and just great week. And I hope it's not too crazy for you. Thanks for joining me.